welcome back to the show and thank you for not skipping through those ad breaks. <laughs> not that you had a choice. Uh, so before the break we talked about housing in Tokyo. Um, and now to here to give us a first-hand perspective is somebody who's from New York but lived in Tokyo for a number of years. You may have seen her on CNN, on the Today Show, on CBS This Morning, or read her words in the Washington Post, Woo! Financial Times, wow. uh, Times of London, the Whoa. Japan Times. Her new book, World Class, this is actually my wife's copy. <laughs> uh, document, that's what there's a bookmark. Um, document, documents her experiences as a mother to three kids in Hong Kong, then Shanghai, and then Tokyo. Please welcome Taru Clavel. Wow! <laughs> Joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So you lived in Tokyo from 2012 to 2016. I did. That's proof that I read the book. Um, <laughs> so based on your experience, is Rudy Giuliani more of a Tokyo rat or a New York rat? <laughs> Definitely New York. Definitely New York. Uh, and which subway system is more conducive to crying? Crying. <laughs> I'd probably cry in both at some point. <laughs> I'm a mother of three kids after all. I would say Tokyo, because everybody ignores you in the Tokyo subway. Uh, <laughs> the Japanese way. The Japanese way, they leave you be. Here, you kind of have a disease and they put like a 10 foot radius rock if you're strained in the subway. <laughs> oh, so that's what people are doing to me. <laughs> starting to make sense. So, how was the process of finding somewhere to live in Tokyo different to, to, to New York? Well, I think people are shocked if they're not from Japan because the spaces are so tiny, so you can actually touch both walls with your hands, and sometimes the sinks are literally over the toilets, and you may just have a little corridor that's 10 feet by 5 feet, and you definitely don't have real furniture. You may just have kind of like most camping seats that's at a 90 degree angle. Um, yeah, tiny, really, really tiny, really efficient, and you really have to be careful about every single thing you purchase. Wow, okay, that makes you feel a bit better about living here. Yeah. <laughs> so, your book is all about your experiences um, in the different education systems in Asia, including in Tokyo. Yeah. Um, can you explain if there's any um, impact on school zoning? Because like in the US, it's huge, right? You try to move to a certain area because you want to go to those public schools. How does that work in Japan? It's very different because in the US, the taxation system pays for the local schools, right? Whereas in Japan, it may be the most equitable form of schooling of almost any country in the world. So the best school is a school closest to your home. So it's not paid for by our local taxes, but by, by the province and by the entire country. So it's not like the wealthier kids from those families that are more privileged get a better education. It's equitable across the board. Right, and it sounds mm -hmm. like there's a lot less um, local funding for schools in Japan as a whole compared to what we have here. Absolutely, absolutely. And here, even if your local school board doesn't necessarily provide that much funding to your school, the parents can create nonprofit organizations and booster clubs and supplement that, and then there's a lot of social reproduction going on, so if you have educated families, they pass that off to their kids, and here is a multi, multicultural, diverse nation with with maybe two parents who are working, um, and maybe English language learners at home, it's very different. Um, so speaking of kind of differences between here, here and there, what are some kind of cultural differences to, to housing, to education that you, you observed when you were in Tokyo? I would say the biggest cultural difference, I mean, in terms of raising kids, is that kids in Japan are completely on their own when they're six years old. And here, that I think that would be considered probably a form of abuse. To the point where six-year-olds, when they go to school, they wear a yellow flap on their backpacks and a yellow hat. And here, when I first saw it, frankly, I thought they'd be targets, because in the U.S., you would never do that to your <laughs> But there's so much kind of community support. Um, and something else is, and I'd love Americans to learn this, everybody follows the rules, right? To the point where you can be in a stop sign at 2 a.m. as a pedestrian, there's nobody around, no cars, and you're still waiting for the red light to turn green. You know, and there's no rubbish bins anywhere because everybody takes home their own garbage and they sort it at home. Um, everybody stands in line, nobody cuts, the trains run perfectly on time. It's like taking a hot bath. It's really relaxing. <laughs> Wait, so it sounds like a form of utopia. Is there anything that the Japanese can learn from, from the US? 
That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> and I actually did a Google search, and it turns out Pew, Pew did a survey, and the answer is no. But, <laughs> but, but I thought, you know, if you've ever been to Japan, they wrap everything perfectly, and they put it in like plastic, and then in paper, and then in a box, and then in a bag, and then it's amazing. And you know, if you go to like Bloomingdale's, I'm sorry, Bloomingdale's, I hope they're not your sponsor, but if you go there, like they don't know how to wrap anything. Right? So I would say, here, they just don't use wrapping paper, they don't wrap anything. They're, they're just excessive. They're just so, that's the only thing I can think of. They're excessive and they're wrapping. <laughs> nice problem to have. Yeah, I think so. What if you flip it? Um, if you could distill, like you spent four years there, probably a ton of lessons you learned while you were there. Yeah. If you could distill it, the key lessons you learned into like one or two points for Americans to take home and take to heart. Well, is, it, is, that, is that even possible to distill it down to one? Well, something that is true to my heart is, so I have a master's in comparative international education. So I was an education journalist overseas, and my area of specialty was literally international education. When I came back to the US in 2016, and people would say, what did you do? And I said, I worked in international education. No one knew what I was talking about. <laughs> and for the rest of the world, learning different languages, traveling overseas is so important. Whereas here, you know, a majority of, of Americans, I don't believe, even have a US passport, let alone speak more than one language, unless it was a mother tongue uh, at home. So I would say that's a huge thing if we could think more about being a little more global and it's a little intellectual. For me, because I work in education, the focus on education in these other countries is so important. And maybe they're driven by different cultural needs. Um, in, in where we lived in Shanghai, I would say in China, it's much more about the gateway to the future and letting the next generation move up from a, a country that was impoverished just one generation ago. Whereas in Japan, it's much more of a social responsibility to support the community because we're only as good as our least educated person. And I wish the U.S. could learn to prioritize the education of each and every child. Yeah. yeah. If you enjoyed learning about those insights, read the book. Yes, please. Come okay. yeah. Yeah. After the show. Um, and to one of the points you alluded to earlier, like a lot of Americans don't have passports, right? And that's something I've been baffled by since I've lived here. I have two passports, um, British and American, and I can't figure out which one's more embarrassing to me. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, my latest joke is people ask me, I'm a single mom, they ask me why I'm dating, and I say it's because I'm looking for a passport now. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. laughs> if you figure out where to go, please let us know. Um, so the book, once again, is World Class. I really enjoyed reading it. Even if you're not a parent, um, there's a ton of cultural insight um, to have. Not just Japan, but China as well, do things better than here, um, and what we can learn from them. Um, Teru, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah.